I'm not quite old enough to have been a Victorian, but 40 years ago I was a scruffy schoolboy, and the school I came to was this one, Eton College, one of the oldest schools in the country. In the Victorian era, on the playing fields of schools like Eton, Harrow and Rugby, some of the world's most enduring rules evolved. Take football. In the early 19th century, football had no rules, so schoolboys made up their own. And some pretty extraordinary games emerged. Oh, Just have a look at this. This is the Eton Wall game. It's one of the oldest forms of football that's still played in the world. And you can see that they use just the stuff that was lying around. This wall, built in 1717, it's one side of the pitch, and it's also a grandstand for the spectators. And the goals, a door and a tree. That looks painful. Oh. I never got to play this game. Is it easy? Um, it is. It's hard work. It's very hard work. I mean, what about the rules? The rules are they're quite complicated. Come inside you. Let this guy out. Do people get injured in there? Not seriously. I mean, there's no momentum involved in the contact, so it's just pushing, no punching. So. But you're rough. That wall looks kind of rough. Yeah, you get a few scrapes, but it's not too bad. In the seconds, Eddie, in the seconds. If this looks like chaos, that's because it is. The rules are so complicated and open to interpretation that punch-ups used to be commonplace. And a goal hasn't been scored since 1909. The ball game's really difficult to play and incredibly boring to watch because you can't see the ball and nobody knows what's going on. However, in 1863, a whole bunch of old boys from public schools decided life was too complicated like this. They got together, formed an association in order to invent rules for football. They called it Association Football. And because it's got a sock in the middle, they abbreviated it to soccer. Come on up, Idens! <laughs> Push! Put some well in it! Get off my foot! <laughs> Soccer became popular with players and spectators all over Britain. By 1900, there were over a thousand football teams playing competitive matches by the same set of rules. Some rules were invented just to make the game better to watch, like the offside rule in 1866. The British rules of sport were about to be adopted all over the world. Soccer, rugger, cricket, golf. But croquet was getting rather dull. The Victorians were after a, a simpler, livelier game, one that could be played on a hot summer's day by both sexes, one that would get the blood moving. In December 1873, there was a grand party at a country house not far from here in North Wales. The guests had hunting, shooting, fishing, feasts, a huge dance, and one of them, a chap called Walter Clopton Wingfield, was so impressed that when he invented a new game, he dedicated it to the people who'd been at that party. He applied for a patent the following year, 1874, and his game came to be called Lawn Tennis. Croquet was no longer de rigueur. Tennis was all the rage. Grand Victorian gardens already had the perfect playing surface, thanks to croquet. But lawn tennis was also helped by the development of a newfangled machine that was invented just before Victoria came to the throne. It was actually invented by a man called Edwin Beard Budding, a mechanical wizard who worked in an ironworks near the cotton mills of Gloucestershire. He was making a machine to shave the nap off the cloth, take off all the little bobbles and make it wonderfully smooth. And he had a brilliant idea. Make a big one and you could shave a lawn. 
In 1830, the lawnmower made its first cut on the great British lawn. The rules that came with Wingfield's tennis kits are quite unlike those of today, and the shape of the court was rather odd. He'd planned a rectangular court, but in this diagram in the book, he wanted to show the wing nets, and so the perspective's all wrong, and it looks as if the baselines are meant to be longer than the net. Well, when people bought the kits, they actually just looked at this picture, and they paid no attention at all to the written instructions. As a result, people made their tennis courts to this hourglass shape. The game proved hugely popular. Within a year, Wingfield sold a thousand nets, complete with all the necessary kit. Is this how the kit would have arrived? That's right. This is one of Wingfield's original boxes. Original? This is the list of everything that's inside. And oh, the box wow. and all the contents contained inside would have cost the princely sum of five guineas. OK, so tell me what's in it. Obviously, there's some nets. You That's need right. a lot of that, don't you? You do. Rackets. This is one of the original rackets from Wingfield's game. It's got a very, very small head and then it's slightly twisted. Bent, it basically. That's right. yes. yes, it is. OK. And the balls? Right, well, that one's... That's that one's squishy. Hollow. That's right. It's made from India rubber, which uh, was invented around about the middle of the 19th century and it was absolutely essential to Wingfield's game. Right. Prior to India rubber being invented, most balls were solid. Right. Like this one. Right. Oh, like this, this, this is solid. Now, that wouldn't bounce, would it? That's not, not on grass, it wouldn't. So you no. needed rubber. The success of tennis must have been partly due to the fact that it allowed young Victorian men and women to, oh, cavort and socialise together. Very risque. How thrilling to be able to jump around and get hot and sweaty like this without breaking any of the delicate rules of behaviour. When it comes to the Bible, what is the line between history and myth? between what we believe and what lies beneath the rubble. Follow the trail with the guy who dares to draw a line in the dirt of ancient lands. He sifts through the layers, solves ancient controversies, and stirs up some new ones. The naked archaeologist lays history bare. Tonight at 9 on History International. My disease is called osteosarcoma, and it's a bone cancer. This could kill her. No child should die in the dawn of life. First thing out of Matthew's mouth, Mommy, I'm scared. I said, Matthew, that's OK, because I'm scared too. Every day, over 200 children come to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital for help. If I could change places with my daughter, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Never in my wildest dreams would I ever think that my child had cancer. These could be your kids. And we need your help today to save their lives. Call now and be a St. Jude Partner in Hope. You'll help provide breakthrough treatments, research, and cures. There's a never say quit attitude with that hospital. Good is not good enough. They want greatness. Every day, every moment matters when you're fighting for children's lives. She has a serious disease that kills. St. Jude is the place that's going to cure her. Please call now and help save precious lives for only $19 a month. Every month you'll receive a photo and story of a child you're helping. We depend on you to see that no child is ever turned away because of the family's inability to pay. St. Jude scientists and physicians work side by side, day and night, to find cures and save children's lives. They've more than tripled the survival rate for childhood cancers. If you want to see your money go to a great cause and help good people, St. Jude's is the place to do it. Only 62 cents a day, $19 a month can make all the difference for a child who's fighting to live right now. A tax-deductible gift of any size will go to work immediately. Your compassion, your call today will help save thousands of children. St. Jude's is going to give up. We're not giving up. We're going to fight till there's a cure for this cancer. Please, call the number on your screen right now. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures, saving children. Did you know that the rich history of the Big Apple is just a trolley ride away? Now, 
the History Channel and New York City are teaming up to bring the city's past to life. Head to Times Square to take a ride on Gray Line's Heritage Tour trolley. Purchase a History Channel New York City pass and visit our Heritage Tourism Center. You can experience hundreds of years of New York City history for yourself when you hop on a ride back in time with New York City, Gray Line, and the History Channel. If you're serious about losing weight and getting into the best shape of your life, you've got to have this free DVD. You'll see how the Bowflex Tread Climber Machine burns up to twice the calories of a treadmill at the same speed. The Tread Climber is definitely not another treadmill. The dual action treadles allow you to move up as you move forward to give you twice the workout in one easy, low impact motion. Call for your free DVD now and see how you can own the Bowflex Tread Climber Machine for zero down and payments as low as $24 a month. Why run when you can walk? This is cardio. It's amazing how much I feel it in my core. This is the best 30 minute workout I've ever had. Greg Duplessis lost over 33 pounds and Maddie Neal lost 50 pounds of fat by walking on the Bowflex Tread Climber. If you're serious about getting into the best shape of your life, call or go online and get your free DVD right now. Bowflex Tread Climber. Be lean, be fit, be Bowflex. The world is getting smaller. Explore the lives, the cultures, and the histories that made the world what it is today. It's time to globalize yourself. History International, because what happens over there matters over here. To be accepted in polite society, the nouveau riche needed to adopt the correct customs and practices, especially in public. The new Victorian wealthy found themselves able to dine out, which meant that their eating, drinking and manners were on display. So they had to learn the new code, because with the new code of dining, it meant they could move up in the world. Hello. Brown's Hotel opened in 1837, the year Victoria came to the throne. Its founder, James Brown, saw an opportunity for creating a genteel inn one that had a dining area open to passing members of the public. It was one of the first in London. In true style of keeping up with the Joneses, the Victorians were desperate to join the upper crust, so they took etiquette to new levels of complexity. Dining out became really quite a tricky business if you wanted to join the, the right set. Smart restaurants like the 1837 still lay their tables according to Victorian codes. Everything on the table must be geometrically placed. A precise two feet from one place centre to the next defines the allowed elbow room, as determined by Queen Victoria herself. In the 1860s, a new fashion of dining from Russia became popular in London. Each type of food had its own set of implements and there were rules dictating how one should use them. Sarah Paston Williams knows them all and introduced me to one particular Victorian invention, the fish knife. It's blunt. It's blunt. And it's flat so, and it's Because bent you too. should never cut fish. You, you divide it like that. Right. So and you don't actually pieces. cut it, yes. Right. And by having this sort of rather weird shape, it's letting everybody know that you're not expected to use it as a knife. I see. So this was a wonderful invention. So but of course it was, again, it was for the middle classes. It was very non-new to use a fish knife. If you were an aristocrat, you would certainly not have had a fish knife and fork. Oh, really? Mm. And you were showing by laying the table with a knife, a fish knife and a fish fork that you had actually bought your silver rather than inherited it <laughs> because it just didn't exist. There were tongs for sugar, forks for cheese and squeezers for lemon. Even eating pudding was far from simple. Pudding. Now, this is, this is creme brulee, right? You're the yes, expert. Yes, creme brulee. The Victorians ate as many puddings as they could with a fork because the spoon, I mean, what a baby eats with a spoon. A spoon's a very easy utensil to handle, and so it wasn't very highly regarded. Were, were these rules really made to trip up the unwary? No, I don't think they were. It was all to just show you, show people that you were very well behaved and that you were in control of yourself. Am I allowed to hold the thing or should I...? You can touch the dish, but I you can. mustn't touch the food. That was the important thing. The, right. Your fingers were definitely... The, the only thing that you could have with your fingers was a grape or a cherry because they've got stones in Oh, you could? Okay. You could, yes, but you, you mustn't eat anything like a... If you wanted, say, an orange. You, you avoided an orange like the plague because you, you couldn't peel it yourself. 
To feel comfortable in public, you had to do the right thing. And if you were in doubt about what the right thing was, you could always refer to Mrs Beaton. Mrs Beaton was the, the lady who wrote all this huge book, including recipes, but at the back she tells you exactly how to behave for dinner, well, all meals, starting with breakfast. Even at a picnic, she tells you exactly what you should take and how you should behave. It was very important. So they needed the rules. Mm, they so did. So they knew how to eat in They knew how to eat if they were invited out. They would know it and not worry about it. They would know exactly how to behave. This was also a time when it became possible for women to make their mark outside the domestic arena. One Victorian woman was even able to use her work to influence the government. Isn't that amazing? That was actually Florence Nightingale herself in 1890, thanking all the nurses and the soldiers that she'd worked with during the Crimean War. In fact, it was they who had an awful lot to thank her for. In 1854, Florence Nightingale left England with 38 nurses, bound for the Crimea. British soldiers were fighting the Russians on the shores of the Black Sea, and Florence was spurred into action by reports that the English wounded were dying in their thousands. Florence was faced with row upon row of soldiers, many barely alive, suffering from war wounds, frostbite, typhoid and cholera. They were crammed into filthy wards without sanitation, hot water or proper food. What really shocked her was that only a fraction of the soldiers brought into the hospitals were dying of their wounds. Most were dying of disease. She wanted to convince the government that the British soldiers who went to hospital were in effect being condemned to death. But she needed proof and she knew exactly how to get it. For two years, she recorded detailed information about each of the patients and their care. She measured everything not only the state of the soldiers on admission, how long they stayed, and whether they lived or died, but even the distance between the beds and the temperature of the drinking water. No one had collected information like this before. Once she'd collected and sorted her information, she wrote a report for the Royal Commission. And in that report, she included a special diagram. It's actually one of the first pie charts and it tells the whole story. Just look at this. Each of these wedges represents a month. So this is February and this is March. And the area of the wedge indicate the number of men who died. This blue area means disease. They'd all died of disease before a shot was fired. You can see that far more men were dying of disease than dying of wounds. It was absolutely awful. And it wasn't until she was able to bring in sensible measures of hygiene that the death rate came tumbling down. And if you look here, by about July of 1855, you can see that far fewer men are dying of disease. She's reduced the death rate from disease by something like 80%. It was a staggering performance. Florence Nightingale did two important things. First, her statistics showed that deaths from disease were reduced by simple hygienic measures. Second, her diagram was a brilliant way to show this. By the 1860s, her schemes for improving hospital care were underway. Florence Nightingale was not only a nurse and a campaigner, but she actually used statistics to change the world, just as her contemporary scientists were seeing patterns in nature everywhere they looked. When it comes to the Bible, what is the line between history and myth, between what we believe and what lies beneath the rubble? Follow the trail with the guy who dares to draw a line in the dirt of ancient lands. He sifts through the layers, solves ancient controversies, and stirs up some new ones. The Naked Archaeologist lays history bare. Tonight at 9 on History International. 
Let me tell you about a very important phone call I made. When I got my Medicare card, I realized I needed an AARP Medicare Supplement Insurance card too. One simple call gave me the chance to talk with a personal health insurance advisor who answered all my questions about Medicare Supplement plans. If you're already on or eligible for Medicare, call now to find out how an AARP Medicare Supplement Insurance plan, insured by United Healthcare Insurance Company, helps you pay some of the 20% of your medical expenses is not covered by Medicare Part B. That can save you thousands of dollars. These are the only Medicare supplement insurance plans exclusively endorsed by AARP, a name you trust. When you call now, we'll send you this free information kit, plus this free guide to understanding Medicare. I can keep my own doctor and choose my own hospital. And I don't need a referral to see a specialist. Call 1-800-380-0396. Now, a personal health insurance advisor is waiting. Horace had a cab business and wanted a website because he wanted people to be able to go online and make their reservations. GoDaddy customer, Shoshana Such. It was important for people to be able to reserve their ride online and pay online. It's very simple. Horace's business is doing very well. Well, thanks to GoDaddy and their array of products, I can handle all of my client needs with one company. Just go to www.godaddy.com slash TV. It worked on me, and it worked for a lot of people I know. Proceed works. Attention, men with thinning hair. The pictures you're seeing are of men who used a revolutionary product called Proceed, a newly patented product that requires just one application every 90 days. Imagine going from this to this after your first application. Proceed works by increasing hair shaft diameter. In clinical studies, statistically significant increases in hair shaft diameters were achieved after a single application. And over just a short period of time, Proceed can make your hair thick, strong, and full enough to help diminish the appearance of thinning areas using it just once every 90 days. That's what makes Proceed so different and appealing to busy men. Because it impacts the hair and doesn't fake it out or leave some gel on it to make it look thicker, my hair looks thicker because it is thicker. This is my real hair. That's what's so great about Proceed. Proceed makes you look great with virtually no effort. You gotta try this, guys. Stop the daily regimens. Get off the life sentence of drugs. Get started with Proceed to start looking your best right now. Are the ravages of age on your hair making you look and feel older? Are you less confident in public at the workplace or around women? Are you fed up with daily routines? Well, now you can try Proceed absolutely risk-free. The exact product selling at Giuseppe Franco's of Beverly Hills for $450, yours to try for 90 days. Plus, Proceed will include three free gifts to help your hair look even better. It's volumizing shampoo and conditioner, plus this two-speed scalp massaging brush, altogether a $495 value. Use just one application, wait 90 days, and if you're not 100% satisfied, send back the unused portion for a full refund, but keep the ProVibe brush plus the shampoo and conditioner as your gift for trying. Proceed. We're the one. Just one application every 90 days. Operators are standing by, so have your credit card ready to order right now. It did exactly what it promised. When I built one of the world's first personal computers at home 30 years ago, I had a lot of help. And now I want to help the next generation of inventors. That's why I'm teaming up with the History Channel and the National Inventors Hall of Fame to give an innovator a chance to win a $25,000 grant and have their invention recognized as the modern marvel of the year. Go to history.com slash invent and change the world all over again. The Sharper Image, new inventions you can own today. While Victorian scientists were uncovering rules in chemistry and nature, engineers were on a different mission. They were creating rules. Sir Joseph Whitworth, an engineer from Manchester, had a vision that the industrial world would work better if things were standardised. So he set about creating rules of precision that we take for granted today. Now, just look at this. It may not look very exciting, but this is the world standard flat surface, as first made by Joseph Whitworth about 1840. It's absolutely exactly flat. And without that, you simply couldn't have any precision engineering. The point is, they were building railways and bridges and all sorts of things, and they needed precision engineering. Without reference standards, like Whitworth's flat surface, engineers would not have been able to create the modern industrial world. 
Mass production of components underpinned the manufacturing industries. All kinds of goods were made to the same common standards, from typewriters to sewing machines, from bicycles to firearms. As far as standards and accuracy were concerned, one place was king. Nowhere in the whole world had more influence in the 19th century than the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, which is just up at the top of this hill. The observatory was set up in 1674 to try to solve some of the navigational problems faced by the Navy. In Victorian times, it was also the place where sailors set their ship's clocks. Since 1833, that big ball up there on the weather vane has been what all the ship's captains in the Thames have used to check their watches or chronometers before they set sail. This was actually the very beginning of standard time distribution from Greenwich. These days, of course, we get pips on the radio. But what I want to do is to check my smart watch here against that ball. When it drops, it's exactly one o'clock. There, I reckon I'm 40 seconds fast. Or maybe the ball's 40 seconds slow. No, of course it can't be, because that is Greenwich Mean Time, or, or rather British Summer Time. As far as time goes, Greenwich rules. The time ball was a good idea, but it couldn't be seen by everyone. So in 1836, the observatory began to distribute its time across London. The Greenwich time lady, Miss Ruth Belleville, would set a pocket chronometer to Greenwich time and travel down the steep hill into London, taking the correct time to clock shops. The whole of the city had its watches set to Greenwich time. So in the 1840s, when time across Britain became standardised to accommodate railway timetables, it was Greenwich time that was adopted. In the 1850s, Timekeeping became more accurate than ever before, thanks to a combination of science and precision engineering. Astronomers knew that the most accurate timekeepers were the stars. In 1854, a new telescope was built to log their movements more precisely than ever before. This is the transit circle commissioned by Astronomer Royal George Biddle Airy. You'd look through here where the crosshairs of the, of the line are. Right. And while waiting for the star to come into view, oh. you'd simply tap on here. Ah, and so you don't have to look away? You don't have to look away. Fantastic. And it records okay, so I look through here, time. and I'm waiting for the dog star to appear, and it's coming up to the crosshairs now. Fantastic. It's all about eliminating error right. and making whoever's using the telescope for these observations, eliminating, eliminating the error and making it as standardised as possible. It's very clever, because you could certainly be accurate to a second, if not better. Oh, oh, wait, 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 yeah. tense, tense and probably less. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It was made by Ransom and Sims, who, who, have, who at the time were very famous for agricultural machinery. And, and lawnmowers. lawnmowers. And lawnmowers, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Terrific. But what Airy was doing was bringing together, or, or, uh, unifying uh, the, these, these great opticians, um, engineers, clockmakers, he was bringing them all together, taking the best from each area that he needed. George Airy's telescope came to play a huge part in defining the way the world is viewed in a rather unexpected way. Greenwich builds itself as the centre of space and time. Tourists come here from all over the world to stand astride a quintessentially Victorian invention. Look, this is it, the Meridian Line. So this is the Eastern Hemisphere and this is the Western Hemisphere. East is East, West is West, Greenwich is where I love the best. In 1884, an international group of delegates declared that Greenwich should be home to zero degrees, the prime meridian the line on the Earth's surface from which all other lines of longitude would be measured. And the exact path taken by this line was defined by the very crosshairs of George Airy's telescope. George Airy's telescope was the ultimate in Victorian high-precision engineering. It defined the meridian line, and in this way the Victorians were laying down standards for the whole world.
These are the White Cliffs of Dover. And this must have been the first bit of Britain that the Romans saw when they came to invade. In fact, they came in force in about May of AD 43. That wasn't the first time they'd visited the islands because Julius Caesar had come over a hundred years earlier, but he only stayed for a few weeks. In AD 43, the Romans meant to stay. In this series, I'm going to see what the Romans brought with them and what they left behind when finally they went home 400 years later. Why did they come? Well, partly for the glory, partly for the farmland and for the minerals like copper, lead and gold, and simply to trade. We'll be returning to those things later in the series, but for the moment, let's see how they established their first foothold. 40,000 troops rode across the channel. After some delay, terrified of what lay ahead, they'd nearly mutinied back in Boulogne and were brought into line only by a direct order from Emperor Claudius. When it came to ship design, the Romans borrowed heavily from